so what Sorry. so what um i want to make sure to do is it just out of curiosity just give me an idea is um do you all have gardens do you have access to a community garden like are you sort of all active gardeners do you have and i'm seeing nodding heads <laughs> um wonderful um are you sort of um sort of ornamental are you garden flowers are you vegetables like have you got a combination of both well, you can pop it in the chat you can unmute yourself whichever is easiest for you just to do that i can see people already getting <laughs> fingers are going <laughs> and we've got here so flowers and veggies both so christine and uh, susan flowers and veggies yeah yeah plant everything <laughs> <laughs> and herbs yeah alexis got herbs yeah I, funny thing is is that in my own garden because i am at home right now this is my basement um yeah yeah <laughs> it's been like this for you know since march 2020 as a matter of fact uh flowers shrubs herbs um tomatoes that's from allison okay so a big a big selection a big group of things so that's wonderful so that gives me an idea of what people are working with um, and what I'd like to do. So um, I'm going to just uh, share my screen and, and I'm going to start with introducing where we are in relation to each other. So, uh, you know, you may, you know, in, in other times, you may have done this presentation at the Hamilton Jewish uh, Family Services Center. Um, but we're doing all of that. You are obviously all at home and maybe uh, Alexis, I don't know if you're home or if you're at that office, I can't tell. No, I'm in the office, but we, it means so much to us because we have community gardens. So I'm excited to hear about this. And uh, I love the RBC. That is wonderful. That's wonderful. So let me just, so, you know, whether this is where you would be for this presentation, if things were normal, um, we have a new normal, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming too. So that's where you would be and in dundas so let me just oh that's dundas so that's still i guess is that where you there we are there we are yes on google maps yeah So, so is that normally where you would, so in Dundas, even though it's Hamilton Family Jewish Services, you're in Dundas, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just curious, and you can use a, a raise, you can raise your hands, you can sort of use a reaction button. Um, how many of you are familiar with Royal Botanical Gardens? So I see uh, Carl is, Cindy is, yeah, Alexis is, a lot, of, a lot of hands are going up. Not surprised, not surprised. But here's something that a lot of people don't realize, that Royal Botanical Gardens is actually 2,700 acres or, um, or 1,100 hectares. Uh, let me just go a tiny bit closer. There we go. That's what I wanted. So it goes all the way here in Burlington from Unsworth, all the way up and around. I'm going to be a little bit generous, but all the way over here to Rock Chapel, down here, behind McMaster, Churchill Park, all through here, Princess Point and up and around. So it is absolutely huge. Of that 2,700 acres or 1,100 hectares, only one ninth of that is cultivated gardens. The rest is natural sanctuaries. So our cultivated gardens, and you may be very familiar with this. Oh yeah, by the way, we've got 27 kilometers of trails. That's what all these little white path marks are. These are the trails. Um, but our garden areas, we have uh, four outdoor gardens, one indoor garden. They are all open now. Uh, this one, some of you may be familiar with. This is the Lilac Dell right here. This is our Arboretum. This is our Nature Interpretive Center right here, where we often do school programs. Not so much now, but we have school programs coming here. This is our uh, Magnolia. Um, orchard here. So we have about 50 different documented collections of plants spread throughout these four garden areas, um, or if I should say five, because that one indoors. This is the rock garden. It's the original garden. It was originally just a great big gravel pit. And then in about um, about the 19, late 1920s, uh, um, McQuesten, who was a counselor at that time, they wanted to create this sort of 
a gateway to Hamilton and they wanted having, you know, something for people to come to. And so this was the idea. So that's where the rock garden, that's the origin of that. And then they use great big escarpment stones to shore up the slopes of that or slope the bowl of that gravel pit. And then the plants were put in there. And there are still plants that were original to that garden. We did a great big um, sort of restoration of this garden about four or five years ago and took a lot more of a sustainable approach. How are we using the water? Where's the water coming from? Um, how or what plants are we putting in there? Why we're putting in certain plants? So you'll notice uh, here a, a lot of native plants, but you'll also notice not as much of a changeover in of, per, of uh, annual plants as perhaps there would have been other years. There'll be certain beds that will be rotated, but you know we're trying to keep more um, perennial plants because they're a lot better adapted to the area. Uh, this is Laking Garden, um, and this actually is a well-known garden. This is a peony bed right here, and we've got one of the largest collections of, pe uh, not peonies, sorry, irises. Uh, there are about 960 different varieties of irises, mostly bearded. Uh, we also have a peony bed on either side and then a clematis bed here as well. Um, one thing that's really interesting is this garden, because of its proximity to the wetlands here, it, it's not unusual when the peonies and irises are flowering, it's not unusual to see turtles nesting in these beds. So, I mean, that's what's happening is, you know, I mean, they're going to places where the soil is nice, it's easy to dig, it's dark, it's warm, perfect for turtle eggs. And then the other two gardens, are over here, and you may be familiar with Hendry Park right here, and then the Mediterranean Garden, um, our only indoor garden. Uh, and uh, Hendry is one of our is the largest of our gardens. It includes a variety of different gardens, a newly renovated rose garden that has a lot more of a a, a, a sustainable again a much more sustainable approach, not just with roses but roses and companion plants. So thinking about how plants can grow together. Um, the other thing about these roses is that they are hardy. They are meant for this area. They're also disease resistant. Um, there was a lot of work done with um, uh, Vineland um, growers and they're the, some of our roses have come um, from, from there as well. And then we've got a native plant garden here, the Helen M. Kipax garden. We've got our veggie village right here. Um, and if you've not seen this garden, this is kind of an interesting one because it's a grouping of a variety of gardens, vegetable gardens, all showing different ways that you can um, grow vegetables, whether you have a cultural vegetable garden, whether you have a, a vegetable garden that is related with, to, to, with companion plants, whether it is just an herb garden, whether it is a garden that is on a terrace or a balcony, or whether it's a heritage or heirloom garden. So it just depends. And so there's lots of different things for, for people to see. What is um, happening here is that this garden, this is our medicinal garden, now renamed our healing garden. And each one of these beds is related to an, um, either an organ system or, um, but related to plants that are being used to treat different maladies. So it might be, these might be plants here that are um, treat cardiac, um, problems. There might be a garden that treats that plants that are used for cancer fighting, such as um, rosy periwinkle, for example. So lots of this is going to be and it will be open soon if it's not open already, but it's uh, going to be a very interesting garden. So that's Royal Botanical Gardens, uh, just to give you an idea of, of some of the space. And I, I think people are often surprised when I say how, how big it is and the expanse that it is. But what I want to go to now is I do want to go to our presentation. And we are going to take a look at how our gardens are growing. Um, but we're also going to take a look at 
putting them to bed. So to start with, um, just to give you an idea, try to talk about some of the things that we're going to be looking at. We'll see if we get to most of these. I'm hoping we do. We're going to talk about soil fertility and amendment. So because your soil is the most important thing in your garden. If it's not healthy, you're not going to grow anything, plain and simple. Um, we're going to be taking a look at perhaps what wildlife we might support year round and how we could do that. Um, and then for those people that want to talk about some of those plants that they've got outside, what do we do with them? So we'll we'll talk about some of those and we'll hopefully we'll get to most of this. So when you're thinking about a, being a gardener, you want to think about the soil health. And I'm going to because we already mentioned that one. That's why I'm putting it up there for you. So what other things do we need to consider as gardeners? If we're going to be planting, if we're going to be doing something, what do we need to consider? And you can pop it in the chat if you want. You can unmute yourself. Uh, opening up the chat now so I can see if anybody puts a sunlight, water. Mm -hmm. The zone, absolutely, yeah. The climate, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Compatibility with other plants, absolutely. Good point, Alexis. I mean, one thing that I put in my garden a lot is uh, garlic. I have garlic. I have garlic all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So soil health, definitely. So we're going to be talking about, oh, clay, moisture. That's right. Where's the water coming from? What sort of soil do you have? Do you have a clay soil, a sand soil? I mean, depending on where you are uh, in Hamilton and Dundas, uh, in Burlington, wherever you are, you're going to get uh, different um, types of soil. Um, you need to think about the nutrients that are available for your plants in the soil. Um, how are you going to improve those, that availability of those nutrients? Um, you need to also consider the biodiversity within your soil. What's living in there already? Because those are the things that are breaking down those dead plants, animals, poop, and releasing those nutrients. What about the varieties of plants that you're going to bring into your garden? Are you looking for heirloom plants? Are you looking for perennials? Like how are you looking for native plants? What are you bringing in? And where is it coming from? So what's the provenance of these seeds? What's the provenance of the plants? Um, I'm not going to, if I'm looking for seeds, I'm going to look for seeds that uh, are sort of have come from at least Ontario. I'm not, I don't want to find, I don't want to buy seeds that have come from California. Those, because that's where those plants are, uh, you know, sort of more comfortable. That's where, that's where they're meant to grow. Uh, they're not meant to grow here. And then also, you know, are there any infestations? How are we going to look after those things? Um, are we going to, you know, insect problems, bacteria, viruses? What can we do about some of those? How can we take care of those and think about it in an organic sense? So when we think about topsoil, topsoil is that, is that layer. So we've got the humus. And then we've got the topsoil. The topsoil is that really good area where there's lots of nutrients. That's where our roots are going to go down to. That's where the water is. That's an important layer of soil. So as a gardener, we can amend that in all sorts of different ways. In nature, so think about a forest or think about a prairie, think about that sort of area. How much time do you think it would take to replace an inch of topsoil. So we're thinking about in nature, not us, but in nature. So you can either pop a number in there, you can, so one, two, three, four, so one to 10, 10 to 50, 100 to 200, more than 200. Number, okay, so Susan suggests number one, uh, Mildred's suggesting number one, with a question mark, we're open for suggestions there, I think. Oh, there's three. So Alexis is saying three. Okay. All right. Five years. Christine's suggesting five. Okay. Hold on to your hats, folks. More than 200 years. 
just to get an inch of topsoil. That's it. And that's in nature. So in nature, it's a very slow process. But we as gardeners can sort of speed up that process a little bit or help provide those nutrients a little bit more easily by doing different things. And that's sort of what we're going to be talking about. So we want to improve our soil. So this is, you know, when we think about, um, you know, adding to that topsoil or making it better for our, our, you know, providing opportunities for more nutrients, we can add fertilizer. Um, and fertilizer, when I'm talking about fertilizer here, I'm not talking about the little pellets that you can buy, that you sprinkle on your garden. The problem with those pellets is that they literally will dissolve and leach right out of your soil um, and, and then be absolutely useless for you. So they're, you know, they're not going to be of any use, um, but there are alternatives to that that we're gonna look at. There's also, you can add organic matter. You can add green manure and you might go green manure. Well, green manure quite simply is clover. That's what it is. And so um, very often in my little vegetable patch, I've got a raised bed where I have vegetables. I'll sprinkle some, these of I'll sprinkle some clover seeds into that garden. And the reason why I do that is the clover actually are, is one of the plants, just like legumes, beans, and peas, um, they have nitrogen fixing bacteria associated with the roots. So they're gonna harness, they're gonna capture that uh, atmospheric nitrogen so that it's available for the plants as the roots break down. So that's a good thing. Peat moss, I'm going to be talking about peat moss in a second. And then there's compost and animal manure. So we'll talk about all of those, but peat moss. So peat moss is from bogs. Bogs is a wetland. And I'm going to say right now that it is not the best. So environmentally, sustainably, it is not the best way to amend or to add organic matter to your garden. And the reason is this, is that peat moss actually comes from bogs. Bogs is a very sensitive, the bogs are very sensitive wetlands. But I want to show you, and, and the reason why they're so, the reason why they're so important is this is where you're going to find our carnivorous plants. This is where sundews live. And this is where pitcher plants live. And this, the peat moss or is, is actually sphagnum moss that's been decayed. So as that sphagnum moss dies, it sort of sinks down to the bottom. Now, the thing about a bog or any type of wetland is they are an excellent carbon sink or carbon storage area. And it's because as those plants die and sink down, what happens is that they are, there's less oxygen available to speed up or to increase the speed of decomposition, unlike if it was a terrestrial situation where oxygen is always available. And what happens is that it takes longer for those plants to decompose. So they're holding onto the carbon better. So let me show you where there are some bogs. And I'm gonna go back to Google Maps and I'm gonna switch over there and I'm hoping you'll be able to see this. So this is where we are. And I'm hoping my old computer will bear with me. Yep, slowly but surely. Okay, so I'm going all the way over to Ottawa. Okay, I'm going to Ottawa. There's Ottawa right there. Because I'm going to show you a bog that is being used now to harvest peat. So I'm going to go to this area. So there's, there's Ottawa. There's Montreal over there. And you'll notice there's the Ottawa River. And you'll notice these darker patches and these darker patches because this is a floodplain. This is a natural floodplain. Very easy to see when you're in Google Maps like this. But as I go closer, you'll see that, you know, all of these, you know, this used to be a solid patch thinking, you know, thousands of years ago, right? Or even maybe 500 years ago. But eventually, I mean, we grew our farms. This is very productive land. There's a lot of nutrients. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this little bog that you see right here, this is a bog. And this is a, this one little 
corner that you see here is protected. This tiny little corner, this is barely a kilometer of trail, but that's where that picture was taken from. That's where this, that's where I've seen the sundews and the, and the pitcher plants. What's really unique about this area is this bog also has moose in it and moose this far south are not usual. The other thing is, is there is a very rare butterfly called the copper bog butterfly that lives in this bog. So this area is protected, but you can see, if I go further back, just wanna show this to you, where is it? There. So all of this used to be bog, but this is what happened to it. So what they do is they strip off all those plants, including the sphagnum moss, and they um, expose all the dead, dead moss the dead and decaying moss and this is what they're this is where your peat moss is coming from now it is a really good addition to your garden as an organic compound as an or as an as a sort of a plant material but it's coming from a very sensitive ecosystem and i'm trying to suggest that there are other things that we can use other than that peat moss and they are this so this is sort of there's alternatives and the alternatives is coconut coir and it can be ground up and what is done is it's put into these literally these cakes so i think i've got mine here with me no i've got it in another i, I moved it back over so it's in the, these literally in these little bricks and all you need to do is like if you've got a, a big sort of big container, a big garbage can, pop one of those in, add water, and it will just start sort of opening up and provide you the same amount of organic matter that you would need to supplement your garden. You can all, they also make them not only out of coconut, but they also make them out of cocoa pods as well. So, so there are alternatives to peat. Uh, you can also get those types of alternatives too. Um, and I've got it right here. You don't have to use peat pots to start your gardens. You can also use coconut coir pots as well. And these ones, just like peat pots, you can put these directly into your garden. So that is an alternative. Um, and yes, these do. These are made in other countries, um, but I, I'm. We have so few. Um, bogs left that this is what I'm prepared to do. So organic fertilizer can be a variety of things. It can include composted manure, it can include worm castings, uh, kelp fertilizer, hydrolyzed fish, bone meal, each of those adding different nutrients depending on that plant. So worm castings, if any of you have a vermi composter at home, you'll know what I mean. Uh, are these, oh, sorry, yes. Are these available in the garden stores? Yes. Uh, this, so I'm, I live in Guelph uh, and, I, and I got these pots and I got the, my brick, just let me see if I can find you the brick. Give me one little second. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm trying No, I had, I had the brick for another presentation and I put it away someplace very safe. Uh, but I got these at um, my home hardware. Uh, that's where I went and got both of these. And they've actually got a good selection of the coconut coir um, types of pots and those, and those, comp uh, those compressed bricks. Um, and they're wonderful. They do just the job I need. Um, and so vermicomposting, so you can use that or, you know, you can buy worm castings, the poop, and that's available. By the way, um, I know we all go, yay, worms in the garden, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, they sort of are, yes. Uh, but here's the thing, is none of those worms are native to Ontario. Every single worm you see has been introduced. Uh, every single species of worm, I should say, that you see has been introduced either from Europe or from the United States. The worms 
so the Ontario worms, the native worms, were all scraped away when the glaciers pulled back. And so that's why we don't have any native worms. So in our gardens, they're just fine. But where they cause a lot of problems is in our forests and how they disrupt what's known as the leaf litter. I know, Mildred, I know. Isn't that shocking? Agreed. <laughs> I, I totally get it. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's, and it's, it's when you see, so when you go for a walk in the forest or the bush, um, you might see these bare patches are around a tree. And that's because the worms have pulled down the leaves into their holes. And that the reason why that's not good is because those leaves, those dead leaves, branches, whatever, twigs, those aren't allowed to decompose naturally. So it's not the slow release of any of those nutrients in their soil. So it's actually a, a very detrimental thing. Uh, there's the kelp and it's releasing potassium. And then so that soil amendment, what it's going to do, it's going to add organic matter. It's going to, you can use compost, manure, leaf mold, peat. It's going to increase the soil organisms. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It's going to help retain those nutrients in the soil better compared to fertilizer, which just gets leached away by the water. It's because that slow release, there's better water retention because there's more space for the water to go. So there's more spaces and therefore there's also more air. And that's exactly what those little beasties need in order to break down. And this can be added. So this is something that can be added now. And we'll talk a little bit more as, as we go along. So those soil organisms that I mentioned, it, they might be nematodes, they might be protozoa, or they might be these little bacteria, these nitrogen fixing bacteria on the, uh, on the, the roots um, of any legume. Uh, but here's the thing, this is what's amazing. So in that teaspoon of soil, are little tiny microorganisms. And these are the things that are breaking down the dead plants, the, the, the dead animals, the poop, whatever is there that's in that soil. But here, how many microorganisms do you think there is in a teaspoon of soil? Any, any guesses? Millions, says Mildred. Five million, says Alexis. Okay. Any, any other guesses? I'll take a couple more guesses if you want. <clears throat> Billion, says Christine. Oh. Well, Christine, guess what? You'd win. Yep, in a teaspoon of soil alone, there are a billion microorganisms. So, I mean, we're thinking like tiny, 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 tiny. Um, and, and, you know, it's not, not a lot that we can see with the naked eye, but all of these microorganisms and other things like, so from algae to, uh, you know, little seedlings, the nematodes, the bacteria fixing, uh, the nitrogen fixing bacteria, um, the protists, the nema, there's the, the, the nematodes, worms, all oh, spiders, mites, uh, what's it, what, uh, millipedes, roly polies, you know, things you really don't want in your garden, but the grubs, all of these things are working together to release those nutrients. So as they're munching those things, they're pooping stuff out and the poop that they're putting out, those are where your nutrients are. And here's the thing, 25% of all the world's animals are in soil, 25%. So they help put those nutrients back in the soil, but also here's something to remember, and this is why I'm starting with soil, is healthy soil is living soil. And that's the thing because of the biodiversity that's in that soil. So those nutrients that are in all those organic things in your soil, those nutrients though, like us, they actually are more 
easily up to, uh, taken up by the plants in a neutral situation. So if the soil is too acidic, if the soil is too basic, those nutrients aren't gonna be available to your plants. So that's why one of the soil tests you can do is to find out you know, what, what, what's, your, what's, the, what's the level of, of uh, acid versus base you have in your soil. What's your pH of your soil? And you can add different things to make it less, more or less um, acid or basic. Um, I'm in Guelph. Our soil is more on the basic side versus the acidic side. If you were living further north, uh, you know, where you've got a lot more conifers, you're going to be more on the acidic side than the basic side. So, you know, but but probably your soil is close to this, is close to that neutral point. Most of our soils are in this area. So this just gives you an idea of, of what's being absorbed or what's being taken up by the plants. So if we're going to add manure and, you know, if you're going to add manure, if you can get it from an organic source, that would be better um, because you, you know, if you're going to get it from just any old farm, how do you know what they're feeding their animals isn't going to pass something on to what you're getting. Um, you can apply it fresh in the fall, but don't apply too much. I tend to not apply in the fall. I tend to add it to my compost pile or I'm going to buy composted manure already. Uh, it, it, it makes it easier on the plants. Um, so when it says rotted or composted, then it's ready to go on. Um, always, so if, if you go to a farm and they sell manure for sale, make sure that it's not like super fresh, make sure it is, it has had time to compost or stuff like that. If it's air dried, the advantage of that is that you get more nutrients in that air dried, you haven't got the weight of the water as well and you can apply it right there. So that's one of the advantages of, because there's less water. Now, the type of manure actually is interesting because if you need to add more nitrogen, maybe go with rabbit. If you need to add more potassium or more calcium, more phosphorus, then maybe go with duck or something else, or maybe go with sheep. It just, it just depends on what you might need to add to your garden. And that's where, again, a soil test might be something that you do. I tend to stay away from, um, uh, if I'm gonna go with poultry, if I'm gonna go with poultry, that I make sure 100% it's composted and it's been sitting around for a while. I will not add that, but it's also a really good one for your garden. Um, if I'm going to have anything, uh, I might go with sheep versus goat. If goat is available, I don't tend to go with goat um, simply because they eat everything. Um, and I don't want to have the risk of um, having seeds or something in there that I don't want. Um, so especially, you know, you just never know. So I, I need to make sure that what I'm getting. But all I can say is make sure it is composted. So how many of you have a composter either at home or in your community garden? I'm just, I, I think you said, yeah, so I know Cindy has one. Yeah, I'm just I'm moving my little thing. So yeah, like Carl Alexis probably had one. So a few people had, yep, there Susan's got one. Yeah. So just curious, what kind of composter do you have? And you can unmute yourselves if you want, pop it or pop it in the chat. Some people just have a great big pile. Some people have this sort of situation. Carl, uh, one open air, two black plastic. Yeah, okay, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yes, and then you put the veggies and the salad all those, yeah, all that produce in there. Yep. Uh, we've got two black ones ourselves in, at home. Uh, the one the city of Hamilton gave me. Yes. Uh, were they the, the black ones? Were they the sort of the square black? Yeah. 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 And that's exactly what I did. I, I got mine from when Guelph was having, uh, you know, a day where they sort of sh uh, give you discounts. And I did the same thing with my water barrels. I got a discount on that as well. Yeah, we built uh, two from pallets. Yes. 
Um, so they might have looked like something like this. Maybe you've got wire on them, partly on them. But I mean, the important thing is, and, and if you look at your composter, the important thing is, is that you, you've got to make sure that there is uh, air getting into that compost. You've got to make sure it, it gets turned over so that um, those little beasties that are in there, just like us, they need air, but they also need water. So it's a good idea to water your compost. Um, this arrangement of three allows you to put the fresh stuff in one and then maybe move it over to the next and then move it over. By the time you've got that third one, you've got good stuff. Uh, mix with organic soil. Um, do you mean you're mixing your compost with organic soil? Yeah. Carl? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what I what I do with uh, and and this is what we'll do is is that very often our our gardeners um, will they, they don't always do it in the fall, but they'll do it really really early spring. They'll bring in their compost and they'll just lay it on top of all the gardens mm -hmm. that they're going to amend that year. And then what they'll do is they'll let it sit there for about a month or a month and a half and then gradually turn it over. But mm. yeah. So when you say mixing with organic soil, are you talking about uh, organic soil that you've purchased from someplace else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, what your compost is, is it's amending. So it's adding to the soil, but it's gonna be jam packed full of nutrients, um, which is important. Okay. And so, yeah, just like, just like Carl said, you know, the veggie peelings, um, the fruit peelings, the cores, it, uh, and, and your home compost is never going to get warm enough or hot enough to handle proteins and carbohydrates. So always keep it to just the produce and eggshells. Um, you can do that sometimes it, just to speed things up a little bit, maybe crunch them up and add them to your compost. The other thing about eggshells, you can also collect them, and we do that in the, in the spring, we'll start collecting them. Um, and I'll have some put aside because when I plant my tomatoes, <laughs> I'll put my eggshells, those eggshells around the tomatoes because the tomatoes like that extra bit of calcium. So when we're thinking about compost, um, you can layer, you can, um, layer it but you can add air and it says layer sunflower stalks so you're that's going to give space um you can turn the pile which as i mentioned there's commercial tumblers i don't own one of those i don't I, I don't know if anybody in this group owns a commercial tumbler but that's the air getting in there because remember you're supporting those little microorganisms um watering your compost if it's not raining regularly water that compost um, you can add nitrogen if you want, you, maybe a little bit of blood meal. That's going to help those little beasties, believe it or not, give them a little bit of nutrition as well. Um, there might be some bacteria in there, but what they're doing is they're actually helping to break things down, which is important. And that heat um, is important. Um, if it, I think it's, um, if it's a, it will get to be about 100 degrees um, Fahrenheit which is a good temperature. And that's gonna start, that's gonna help break things down. Um, it, it, it has to be, I think about 140 plus in order to break down adequately proteins and carbohydrates. Our home composters will never get that. That's why, so for me, I put all my produce and my coffee grinds and my tea leaves, that all goes into my home compost but the city green waste, that's where, you know, bread and, and leftover food and meat and bones, that's where they'll go. That's where it will go in there. Um, it, yeah, so fully digested when stayed at 140 degrees for a week. And that's not something that our little composters can do. Our composters are usually about 100 degrees. So it, when it gets that hot, then you are killing those weeds, those weed seeds and those disease organisms, but our compost will never, it doesn't usually get that hot, perhaps unless it's the summertime. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't risk depending on that. Um, the quality 
of the compost or manure is important. So if you're thinking about how much do I buy or how much do I need, this is always a, a good um, guide, two kilograms for every square meter of soil. So if you're thinking, you know, if I'm gonna buy some compost right now, you know, what am I gonna buy? I um, the compost that I like to buy um, is, uh, the other compost, and I didn't, I forgot to mention this, is um, composted um, seaweed. So composted kelp, so that's a really good one too. Uh, keep that in mind. And then you want to, at this time of year, once your vegetables are finished, you know, five to 10 centimeters, so about two to three inches, no more than that, that's sort of top. So two to three inches of compost or composted manure, that's a good layer. And you can do that now, or you can do that in, in now, or you can do it early in the spring and it will just gradually, and then um, mix it in later on. So we're talking about decomposition. We're talking about things decomposing. And this is a, here's a fun little fact. So I'm curious, um, which one do you think takes the shortest time and the longest time? So we have aluminum can, apple core, cotton sock, batteries, paper towel, plastic bags, plastic bottle, styrofoam, wool sock. So which one do you think takes the shortest and which one takes, takes the longest? Apple can is apple core is shortest. Okay, so we got a, so we got to vote for the apple core. Plastic okay, bags apple core, longest. So what do you think is the longest? Sorry, Carl. Plastic. Plastic, okay. And then uh, Bill suggesting styrofoam is the longest. Uh, Christine's agreeing with you with the apple core. Okay, all right. I just want to give people a chance in case their typing fingers aren't quite as fast. A battery, so Mildred thinks the batteries might be the longest. Yeah. Okay, batteries, there's another, there's another vote for batteries. Okay, okay. Wool socks, the shortest. Ah, interesting, Susan, okay. All right, and paper towels. Well, Bill, guess what? You are right. Paper towels. Paper towels are actually the, the shortest. It's a uniform type of thing. It's already sort of slightly broken down. Apple core is the next one. And apple cores take longer because when you think about an apple core, it's that, that, it's that tough bit of... Um, area that cut, that surrounds the seeds and the seeds are also very tough so unfortunately the apple core is second one to two months so not that far off uh wool socks one year uh batteries and what were the batteries batteries are about 100 years plastic bottles 450 years but here's the thing styrofoam oh, right. a million years maybe so, you know, this is something to think about when we're, and this is where we can be conscious consumers. If we're going to get takeout food, do we support places or can we suggest to those places, look, try to find compressed cardboard. Um, it's not easy, but I mean, it's something to think about. Yeah, I know, Mildred, I love your emojis. <laughs> I know, it's trying, I know, crazy, I know, I know, I know. Okay, so mulch. So mulch is something that we can also add. It, it can be compost. So it can be compost, uh, but it can also be other stuff. And what mulch is there for is to help um, with the, it's to help uh, keep the moisture in. It's to help keep the ground cool. It's to help keep weeds down. So it's going to do all of those things. Um, it's going to eventually add organic matter and keeping the soil cool actually is good because it's going to reduce the amount of evaporation of that water because you're always wanting to keep the water in your soil. So you can use a variety of things. You can use straw, that's not a problem. Don't use hay, hay has too many seeds in it. So you can use straw. Uh, you can use um, uh, compost like this, you can use wood chips, but I want to put a little cautionary note, not the huge, great, big, chunky bits of wood chips. If you're going to use wood, try to get the shredded bark, the shredded natural bark, not the colored stuff, uh, any color, 
Uh, if you use black bark, the problem with black bark is that it attracts the sun and it causes a, a more, va a more evaporation. So it dries things out a little bit more. But if you can try to get shredded bark, uh, that is a, a good alternative to, um, to uh, so the big chunky bits of bark, not a good idea. And the other thing about the big chunky bits of bark is that it actually takes a little bit more energy of those little beasties to break it down, those little microorganisms. It takes a lot of energy for them to break it down. So you're not gonna get as many nutrients out of that um, as you would out of compost or the shredded bark or the, the straw. You can add it, as it says, to keep the disease, to keep the, uh, when you make sure it's disease and weed free, that's a key thing. So that's why I suggested uh, straw rather than, um, uh, rather than hay, but also think about the compost. Where's that compost come from? Um, a couple of inches, um, on the topsoil and then it can freeze, that's okay, uh, because then that will uh, you know, sort of prevent those little mice and voles from coming in, but then maybe you want to have a little place for them to be, it just depends. Um, you can also add leaf mold and that's just sort of gradually decomposed leaf, uh, bits of old leaf. Um, you can uh, uh, also use evergreen boughs as mulch um, but be careful because if your soil is already acidic, you may not want to add those evergreen boughs. Okay, water. Now, um, here's a question for you. We've been talking about how, you know, all these good organic practices, and one of those practices is watering. How do we save the water? So organic gardens use how much less water than conventional gardens? 10, 20, 30, or 40 percent? What do you think? <laughs> hmm, people thinking 20. Okay, Christine's going to go for 20. 20, maybe. Mildred's going to think on the 20, 20. There's another 20. Oh, there's a 30. There's a 40. Okay, so we looked at we've got almost all of them. There's a 40. I wish it were 40, but it is 30. And that's still pretty good. Um, and it, it, the 30 though, um, you know, I mean, that's so some of the things that we probably already do. Um, and rather than just sort of using our hose or using a sprinkler, those are sort of using a lot of water. If we can direct the water to where it needs to go, and that is onto the roots rather than on the whole plant, the whole plant isn't going to use that water. It's the roots that are going to use that water. So. Uh, in your community garden, do you have a water barrel? Oh, big watering can at the roots. Excellent, Allison. Yeah, that's what you want to do. You don't want to pour. You don't want to pour the water. I mean, you could, but you don't. It doesn't help it, pouring it over the plants. Put it right where they're needing it, and that is exactly at the roots. Um, do do people have water barrels? I didn't. I missed. I missed hands going up, or I missed anything. Or even a yes. So water barrels may not, this was something that um, a water barrel, uh, this isn't my water barrel. I have another couple of different water barrels at home. Um, but our water barrels, we uh, are, the city of Guelph did, uh, you know, sort of buy a water barrel and get a really good price for it. Yeah, it, it's absolutely wonderful. We use it for inside, for outside. And, you know, I mean, this is where this time of year, we're sort of going, okay, how much longer do we have our water barrel for? Uh, had a water barrel, found it too difficult to move water from it to the garden. Yeah, I, so some water barrels, you can actually get, a, you can actually attach a hose to it. It depends on the nozzle that you've got. Um, we do it with a watering can. <laughs> so yeah, lots of trips going back and forth. <laughs> It's not fun. I know, Cindy. I know. I get it. I get it. And, and th thank goodness for my husband. <laughs> um, and the other thing is also, depending on how easy it is to take your lid off of your water barrel, we sometimes will dip a bucket and you get it that way. But yeah, I mean, it, it, so see what the nozzle is at the bottom and you might be able to attach a hose to it and do it that way. I don't know. Uh, the other thing you can do 
is you can some of you and this is what we're doing in a lot of our in our uh, rock garden and in our newly renovated rose garden we've got a lot more drip irrigation and the drip isn't on top of the soil like it's showing you there the hose is actually under the ground so it's even closer to where the roots are um, and that's something that we've got so anything that you can do to sort of prevent too much water going into the atmosphere and more water getting directly to the roots that's going to help things and as you know with the with the mulch as well that's going to help things as well okay so um a quick little note about and i'm not quite sure why i've got this one here because i thought i was going to go directly into um positive uh, into uh local plants and uh, stuff like that but we'll jump to this one um bringing plants indoors so some of those plants that you've got outdoors you need to bring them in just like when you were starting your seedlings and you gave them time to harden off so slowly brought them outside you need to do the same thing with your tender plants and non-hardy plants you need to gradually bring them in uh, you do it too fast and they're going to go ah! and they may lose a lot of leaves uh, you might want to repot them and if you're going to repot them um, a really good way to do it is um, what's called double potting and if you're it's much easier if you're going from um, smaller to larger and the way you do it is you get your larger pot you put some soil at the bottom Put the smaller pot the pot the plant is in now put that into your uh, other pot jam soil all the way around lift out your pot with your plant gently take your pot your plant and that soil out loosen it a little bit and pop it into that hole that you just made and then add whatever you need to add to uh, put it back easy it's called double potting you may want it's, it's a wonderful idea I, I use it all the time um and just when you bring things in just make sure that you haven't brought in any little beasties that you don't want to have in your garden you might want to there's lots of insecticidal soaps that are organic that are on the market um you can buy it at, at your store or you can just get a little bit of mild soap and water and just clean your leaves off just to make sure that you're not bringing anything in um, if you've got containers as it says if it's not cast iron empty it because it will cause problems if you leave the plant in your cast iron pot um, or you know if you're leaving it in try and put their styrofoam <laughs> or bubble wrap or something you want to protect that plant um, and you want to protect the roots of that plant. Um, ceramic and clay, bring it indoors. Cement and wood, if you take the plant out, the soil out, tip it upside down so it doesn't collect any water or anything in it in case it splits or something like that. And then um, this is also a good time to start another garden. If you want to, uh, maybe you want to add another raised bed. This is a really good way to, to get things going so that it's ready for you to start growing in the spring. And it's called the lasagna garden. I don't know whether you've heard of that, but it's layers of what, you know, green and brown. The green being the nitrogen, so that's yard waste, veggie scraps. Um, and then the, the brown are the leaves that have fallen and the straw. And that's going to provide the carbon so these layers are really good and it's an easy easy way uh, remembering that you put that layer of um, cardboard and newspaper that you've doused with water that's a really good way to sort of get the base and then you just keep building these layers up if you just look up lasagna gardening afterwards and and i can also send some more information about this to alexis i can send some about this but this is a good time to start so that if you if you're thinking about a raised bed you can do this in the spring but if you do it now then you'll be ready to grow in the spring um and if you want to have grass ah, that's how i made my garden it's a great i love lasagna gardens they're so that's how we made our first raised bed too um so you can keep the grass on the lawn you don't have to 
trim it and your grass shouldn't be that trim. If you've got grass, don't keep it really trim. You, you, you don't need a golf course grass, just a regular grass. Cause it's the longer it is, the, the or the longer you give it a chance to grow, those roots are gonna be better too. So it's gonna help the roots. And then that longer grass as it, as the snow falls, it's going to bend over. It's going to help insulate that. If you're going to, if you've got some thin patches, this is when you want to, you can, well, you can do it now or you can do it in April, but you want to add some compost and then want to overseed. You're going to put more seeds than you would sort of typically put down and then, and just rake that, put a little bit of water on it. And that will sort of get things going. So early September, maybe I've missed the boat for it now. Um, cause we've got some cool weather coming, but maybe try that for early April. And then this is also when you want to add some of that fertilizer that we talked about, some of that organic compounds, um, to sort of help get things ready for the fall. Um, your annuals and your vegetables, you know, take a look to see if there's any diseased material and, and, you know, you don't have to get rid of everything. Um, but if there's something that is not looking too good, so here, so, so there's, there's a little virus on this plant. I, I would be sort of cautious about this. Is this, you know, is this, is this leaf like this on more than just one? Is this a whole plant? You might want to do something about that to, to, to get rid of it. What pests are you seeing on your leaves? If you're just seeing, you know, on one or two leaves or on part of that plant, get rid of those ones. You don't necessarily have to get rid of the whole plant. And it's the same thing with, with mold. And very often mold and mildew happens on plants because they're maybe really close quarters or they, there hasn't been a lot of airflow around. So there isn't a lot of drying. So keep that in mind too. This is when you want to sort of take those bits off. Um, for a lot of the plants, I sometimes just leave them over the winter. And then what I'll do is they'll gradually decompose and I'll fold them in, I'll till them in in the spring. And then that will be, you know, the, they'll gradually decompose, but uh, they'll also add space to the, to the soil when I till it in the spring. But I just sort of leave things alone. I don't do a lot of work with this. This is also the time of year <clears throat> that you want to start planning your garden um, for, you know, now is the time for you to look to see, okay, this maybe I'll maybe we'll add some more flowers. And at this time of year, I'm hoping that people have goldenrod. I'm hoping people have New England aster. These are the plants that the fall insects that are getting ready to overwinter or migrate. This is what they're feeding on right now. But not only are they feeding on it, but eventually those plants are going to seed and those plants will be, those seeds will be available as food for lots of other animals later on. Um, if you're wanting to support pollinators, um, perhaps start thinking about how you're going to add some water to your garden. Um, very often, if you sort of have a bare patch of soil, and I took this picture, you can see that it's a garden area, and there's this, um, this swallowtail is just dipping its proboscis into this moist soil and getting a little bit of minerals and you know you are helping an animal with that you can sometimes just have a I have a I have a couple of stones that have a little couple little dips in them and that's available also for those animals um, so keeping in mind you know ways that you can bring water into your garden um, shelter uh, if they are, uh, you know, are you providing habitat for uh, nesting or egg laying by different insects or birds? Um, are you, have you got overwintering sites? Are your plants providing oils, resins, mud, leaves, minerals? All of these things are what insects need. So I've got here something to show you. And this is from my garden. And I'm just going to switch over. So uh, let me just move that over a little bit, a little bit too bright there. So these are just stems of plants, but what I wanted to show you is that you can see that in this one, there was something right here, there is something right here. So these are empty now, but this is where um, the bees would have um, 
they would have dug out the pithy part of that plant and then they would have they would have perhaps lined that little uh, chamber if it was a leaf cutter bee they would have lined it with leaves or maybe with mud or something like that and then they would have put the bee bread which is just the the nectar and pollen they would have put that um, at the base of that little chamber put the egg on top of that sealed it up and ready for the next one so it's a series of that and and part of why i know this has happened is that um, if you look at there let me see if i can let me see if i can get the focus right uh, there so that little stem you can see the hole right there and that was dug out by a bee that was dug out by a bee to make a little nest. And the other reason why I know bees are using my plants is because of this. If you ever see these little sort of postage st uh, stamp type shapes in your leaf, this has been cut out by a leaf cutter bee. And what they'll do is they'll cut it out and then they'll hold it in there on their abdomen with their legs or on their thorax with their legs and they'll fly there and they'll line their nests they'll line that little sort of hole that they've created with these leaves and then or some will chew them up and uh, you know sort of use that for the nesting material so your plants are if so when i'm looking at some of my plants um what i'll do is i'll leave them now but later on in about March, what I'll do is I will probably cut them and I'll leave about a foot. And that foot will be what they need to, so, so here, so look at those are stems from uh, last year, from the previous year. And these are new plants coming up in the spring. But each of those, and you can see a little dark dot right there, a little dark dot. Each of these has been, there's been an, a bee that has dug out that little nest. And so they've built that little nest like that. Um, oops. And if you're looking, you're wondering what plants could I use? Uh, or what plants would they use to build these nests? And, and you're looking for plants that have pithy center stems or have hollow stems. Uh, so uh, golden alexanders, blackberries, currants, raspberries, elderberries, roses, sumacs, reeds, all of those are great plants to have. And you can see a little bee doing its thing right there. And then there is, and there's that same picture there. So when you're thinking about what you can do for um, when you think when you're thinking about what, what can I do? How can I help insects or how can I help other animals? And quite simply, you don't have to tidy up your garden. You don't have to make it pristine. Um, and, and here's people go, oh, my gosh, I, have you seen this? I do, do look at this. Garden. What a mess. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what you can do. You put a sign in your garden saying pollinator friendly garden and people will walk by and they'll go oh look at that's a pollinator garden i did that for for about four or five years i never had a sign in my garden my garden never changed and i could see people's looks you know as they walked by you know i could see the looks on their faces and so i put the sign in my garden within an hour i had someone walk by <laughs> i was like okay done so, you know, if you have leaf litter, you don't have to, you don't have to clean the leaf litter or you don't have to clean the leaves up, leave those leaves. If you don't want them piled on your grass, that's fine. Put them to the edge where they'll, where other, where insects will be very happy to use them. Put them in your garden, put them actually there. You're going to, that's going to be compost for next year. That could even be a mulch. Um, don't the long grass that's okay um, on the edge of you know I, I don't have a lot of grass but on the edge that's where my grass is slightly longer that's going to be overwintering sites for a lot of insects including woolly bears um, caterpillars the plant stems remember keep those about eight to ten inches if you cut them really short 
Now, I know some people might have those um, B booths or those B hotels. The only thing about those commercially produced ones is you need to make sure they're long enough. If they've got to be at least six to eight inches, if they're less than that, then all you're going to get are nails. And the males are all going to come out around the edge and they're going, where are the girls? Where? They won't be there. The, the females are only produced when there's a longer, um, uh, when there's a longer tube. Uh, rotten logs, another really good source of um, uh, habitat for all sorts of uh, insects and, you know, beneficial insects. So not only bees, but all sorts of insects that are going to help gradually decompose that or break it down. Tree cavities, rock piles, all of these things are really good. And then of course, winter interest. So these plants are going to be perhaps food for all sorts of bird species, maybe little, um, you know, other animals that are around but it's also interesting to see some of the colors and, and, and the way the plants and the way the snow falls on them, the way the ice or the frost freezes on them. So there, my friends, is getting ready for winter. There's a lot of stuff there. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, I'm, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer questions. I see we have someone on the phone and I'm, I'm sorry you weren't able to see my pictures, but I'm hoping that I I said enough that uh, you got what you needed. And I see Bill is not necessarily Bill, sorry. <laughs> okay, any questions that I can answer? I do, Karen. It's with regards to soil in container pots. Now, when you remove the annuals, normally what I've been doing, I've done both. I've kind of thrown the soil out and I've also just put the soil into my regular garden. Is there one way? one is better or you know what what i do with my annuals is if i'm going to change that soil i'm going to i actually put it in my compost oh so, okay and that's what i do that's that's what i do and i know mm -hmm. that very often with our annuals uh at, at rbg what we'll do what they'll do is they'll like you'll see these great big mounds of you know where the where the um the big pots in hendry uh, those big pots will be emptied and then just dumped into a compost and a grad and that will just be added to everything else. Okay. Because that's the nutrients in a pot, in a soil, in a potted plant, mm -hmm. it, it, the, the nutrients aren't going to be there because there's nothing, it, it's been used. Right, so that's why, right. that's why you need to change your soil every so often in a potted plant. So for some, so any plants, if they're annuals and they're in pots, just chuck them in the, just chuck that into the compost. Oh, just into a compost. You don't you, you don't want to mix it in with your other soil or anything I, I like just, that. Or well, I, I by putting it in the compost, then I know that it's going to add to that. Okay. Uh, but also, if I add it to other soil, I'm I'm sort of weakening that other soil because I'm not adding anything to okay. it. If okay. I were going if I were going to do anything, I might add some. I might add it directly to compost. Okay, but I, I wouldn't understand. add it necessarily to just yeah. regular soil. Just another question. We've got a fire pit and I was just wondering about the ashes. Oh yeah, and ashes, you, uh, I see we have the same thing. I just add them to our compost. Oh, to the compost, not directly to the soil, it, just- No, and then that way it's it's sort of mixing around, but it's also sort of, again, it's, it's um, sort of not diluting it, but it's spreading the wealth, you might say. Okay, all right. Yeah. Got to start one of those in the corner there somewhere at home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks, yeah. Karen. Oh, my Very pleasure. informative. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Any, any, oh, yes, Cindy. I, I love this, Karen. Um, with pot, with um, testing soil, I, I purchased one of those testing kits, but I don't really trust the results. <laughs> and I don't know, how, um, you know, I've got different beds around the garden how important is it to take a test for from each garden well you know I, I i would i would take it from well you know i guess it depends you know if the source of your soil is the same in each of those beds then i would say probably um and and, and also uh, are you looking are you looking to test the nitrogen phosphorus and potassium or the uh, the acid yeah, you know, I mean, you can try those. I mean, whenever I've done it in my garden, it looks like my garden is absolutely wonderful tickety-boo, but you know, 
I know by looking at some of the plants, I'm going, mm, no, not quite. You need a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, use, the, use it to give you an idea what you might want to add. So, you know, if you want to add nitrogen, then add some kelp fertilizer. And the kelp fertilizer, the bag looks like, and I've got it right here. Yeah. The bag looks like so this is what this is what i use in my garden and this is kelp fertilizer and really it is very it turns out it, it, it literally it's just it's just tiny pieces let me see if i can get a little closer to you i've got i've got my present i've got my my room all because as i say i'm in my basement so it's a bit of a there but it looks like that the little tiny tiny ground up pieces and there is the bag. Uh, there, there's the bag. So that's that's the that's the bag, and that's what uh, that's what I might use, especially more so. Um, I might add that to a, a sort of a, a new bed where I want to sort of give a little bit of nitrogen, but also I'll just put a little sprinkling of this in my potted plants. I'll just, I'll just use that. So I won't use fertilizer. I'll use the kelp. And that will allow for a very slow release as it breaks down slowly, very slowly. Yeah. Um, no, <laughs> put in a certain good. Okay, I put in avocado. Oh, I put in avocado pits and skin and peach pits. Yep, it takes a long time, but it's bad to. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think it's bad to add. I think you can easily add any vegetable or fruit matter into your compost. Just know that those bigger things will take longer. Um, that's why when I'm suggesting eggshells you know, scrunchle them up a little bit. And that's going to sort of start things going a little faster um, with avocado pits and with peach pits. You know, you, I don't know, get a hammer and smash them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you're right. They do take a little bit longer. And so I don't necessarily, actually, to be in my personal home compost, I'll just give those to the city. I, I just put them in the city compost because I've got so many other things that I'm putting in my own personal compost, my own home compost. You know, I, 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 my beasties are working hard enough. They don't need to work extra hard for, for those. So I just put that in the city compost to be totally honest. And if, if it were RBG, they have these great big grinders that they use to help start that plant material getting smaller right from the very beginning. So it's not the same for them. And then any pruning of twigs or branches that I do, I'll save some and just put them on, you know, a, a sort of one sort of section of my garden, um, sort of off to one side, not in the garden, but off to one side. And that will add habitat uh, that will provide habitat for, um, animals, possibly bees, who knows, but I'll put it off to one side. Um, if there's a lot of woody material, then um, our city does a regular pickup of woody material. So I'll give it to, I'll, I'll let the city take care of the big ones. Okay, any other questions before we have to go? Because I, I know I've gone over time and I so apologize. Yeah, Fortuna, another question. Okay, so I know that the city is offering uh, free compost. I uh, just saw it in the paper the other day. Is it a good idea to get it? I mean, to, you know, are the weeds going to be? If, if, they can, if they can get their compost 140 plus degrees, then theoretically, theoretically, those weed seeds from things like, um, you know, the garlic mustard, <laughs> Those, yeah. theoretically those weed seeds are going to be sort of com uh, you know they're going to be composted but i i i don't know i mean i don't use the city compost um i will thank you either, 
I, I, yeah, I don't use my, I don't use our city compost just because I don't want to risk it. I know that I'm like, if I find, if I get some, um, if I get things like, if I find gout weed or if I find garlic yeah, yeah. Mustard, or if I find even yeah, yeah. that yeah. goes into the city compost, that's not going into my compost. No, I never put weeds in. Yeah. Yeah. Never. Okay. Thank you. The, the, the seeds, the, the, um, the clover seeds, yeah, they, they may not germinate fast enough now, Cindy, but they will germinate, um, they will germinate in, in, for spring as well. So, but put them in, put them in there. It's an amazing crop. It will, I mean, it may germinate there. It may, we may still have enough time for them to germinate. I haven't put them on my garden yet, so it better work because <laughs> I'm counting on it. I just haven't had time to get out there myself. Been busy with stuff. Yeah. So, and you can, um, there's lots of, there's a couple of different uh, varieties. I think it's black clover that I've used, but I mean, I get from our, my, I go to my home hardware. I love my home hardware. <laughs> um, uh, it's got, so it's got some good stuff in it. Uh, but you guys have got some good garden centers where you are too. You've got uh, Holland, no, Park. Holland Park. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice little one. You've got Tara just north of there. So, yeah. Uh, what about, uh, sorry, the, uh, the use of cover crops. And that's what clover would be. So okay. clover, um, rye is another cover crop. Uh, that's another cover crop you can use. And that's the green manure. That's really what it is. And so... You know, farmers, uh, my, yeah. I, I, I grew up on a farm. My dad would put rye seeds out after he'd harvested um, the winter wheat or some, not winter wheat, but after he harvested the beans, he'd put um, some rye out there. As, and that would be one of his fallow fields. Um, so, yeah, so rye or, or, or the clover. Okay. And then, Annie, oh, okay, Karen, there's just one other question too that came in that was typed. Oh, sorry. I said, no, would you prune your large uh, hydrangeas and rose of Sharon in the early spring? You know what? I'm not the one to ask that. <laughs> I was afraid someone was going to. So tell you what I'll do. Tell you what I'll do. Because I, do, I, I, I don't mind doing this. Um, I'm going to send that question mm -hmm. to one of our gardeners that I know is going to be able to answer that question, but I'm not going to be able to answer it well enough. And I don't want to give you any wrong answers um, because I don't want you to, I, I don't want you to, 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 to lose anything. So hydrangeas and rows of Sharon. Um, there, I will ask pruning because uh, there actually, I, I may even have a little video clip of one of our gardeners talking about that. But okay. let me ask, and then I will send my answer to you, Alexis, and then Alexis will send it on to Allison and whoever, yeah. But I don't want, I, I have something in my mind, but I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I don't need I, the wrong information. I just want to say, like, I'm, I'm, I, I'm always tortured about that. I know, I know. So, and I have, I bought some new ones this year, a smaller one. And then they're saying some some you have to trim yeah. right after they bloom. Yeah. Because if you don't, then they won't bloom next year. Yes. And see, that's why I don't, that's why, because <laughs> I know there's two, there's there's one you can trim in the fall, one you can trim yeah. in the spring, that's one right. you have to trim after it flowers, one you can trim before. I and know. That's, that's why I know that. I know that. And I and I do not want to give you bad information. I know for myself, I have a beautiful red currant. That one, I'm going to trim. I'm going to trim it to about a third of its original height. So it's going to get a very big um, trim to this year. Yeah. But they, um, I, I get, I get red currants on it as big as my thumbnail. Huge. I have, to, I, I have two big uh, hydrangeas that are from they're I didn't know that they would grow this big, but they grow about eight feet tall. Yeah. And I know that I can, by trial and error, I know that I can cut them way back in the spring. Yeah. But I bought three new ones or smaller. Yeah. Quite expensive ones this year. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of think from when I was reading the instructions that they're more finicky about yeah. pruning. 
so I guess what you need to find out and, and, um, and, and, and whether you were able to tell me this now is what variety of hydrangea there they are. And so what, what, you know, that might help, but I'll, I'll still get the information yeah, I'll get it to yeah, Alexis, yeah. and then she'll share it with you. Okay. Thank you very much, Karen. This has been not a problem because yeah. I, I do not want to give you the wrong information. <laughs> so, so pr pruning is pruning is not my forte right now. Okay. I can talk about a lot of other things, but um, pruning is not my forte, and I will be the first to admit it. So, any other questions that I can help answer? It doesn't look like it. No, okay. Karen, I really oh, want. Oh, oh, an espalier. Oh, apple tree, uh, Fortuna, which is not very successful. Uh, yeah, pr pruning it again. It's the same question. So I can. Uh, we okay. I can I can ask um, uh, tips about pruning that espalier apple. Tree. Uh, I don't know. It's a hard one. That's almost like a. It's almost almost like um, a bonsai. You know, it's the same type of situation. You know, you have to be very careful. Um, but I, I'll see if there's any information that any of our gardeners have about uh, that type of pruning. Thank you so much. But no, no, I, I don't know that will because we used to have in the old, old, old rose garden, there used to be a huge, great big sort of um, uh, not gazebo, but there was there used to be sort of a, 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 a place where we had all sorts of um, were they magnolias? What were they? Isn't it funny? I can't remember now because they weren't roses. Was it wisteria? No, we've had, we've still got our wisteria. This wisteria is still over. It's still over the bridge that goes into Hendry. We've still got the wisteria there and we've got the wisteria still um, as it goes into the main building from Spicer Court. But this was, um, we have, we used to have a whole bunch of trees, but you know, that espalier um, uh, pruning, that's tricky stuff. That's not easy. Yeah, you really have to know what you're doing there. Yeah, that's that's why I like it sort of I, I equate it to bonsai. You know, a snip here, a snip there. Yeah, not the easiest. Thank yeah. you. So I will pass what I can. I will pass on to Alexis. It may take me a couple of days because, you know, people are busy out in the gardens and stuff like that. So it depends on when they're available to get back to me. So but I've written it down. And I'll get it to you as soon as I can. Karen, I wanted to thank you for being here today um, and everyone for being here. I thought it was a really great talk. It was engaging. It was interesting. It gave me a lot of food for thought for how I grow my, my plants. Um, and I'm hoping to actually have these kind of workshops continue with the RBG because I think, again, as we grow community gardens, as we try to build a uh, enhance our wellness across the community, um, these workshops are really important and I love a group of kind of garden nerds getting together and talking about plants and doing great things so um thank you so much and thank you everyone for being here today it was fantastic my pleasure my pleasure I'm so glad that we could do this and uh yeah you know keep me in mind I've got <laughs> got lots of presentations that we can do but if there's an opportunity for you to if there's a presentation that you want that is very specific to a type of plant or something like that, let me know. And perhaps we can work out an opportunity for one of our gardeners to join mm -hmm. you to do a presentation. So, um, so I'm gonna turn that over to these know, guys too. I'm gonna pardon? say to these guys, these guys in the audience, if you have any ideas, yes, please send me an email so I can reach out to Karen and we can work on setting Absolutely. this kind of stuff up. It'd be if really you incredible. Want, if you want one of our gardeners to be doing a presentation or to answer questions like indoor plant care or rose care or whatever, those presentations have to be done between the, like the end of November to about the beginning or end of February, because okay. that's when they are not in the gardens. No. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so that's the only thing is, is, is we, if we're gonna do a presentation like that, it, it, it's a very, so the, the window is really short. So keep that in mind. So if you've got an idea for something, let Alexis know, we'll talk about it and then we'll go from there. That'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, thanks so much. Have a great day and stay Thank safe out there. Thank you everybody, there. take okay. care. Bye-bye.